Hey friends, welcome back to another Great Commission Alliance Media Channel Bible Bite. I hope you're well. I have an important question for you, and that is, do you like cat videos? Maybe cat videos like this one. <laughs> that was our cat, Violet. And whether you like cats or cat videos or not, you're going to love this Bible Bite. We're continuing our series on science in the Bible. Today we're going to be looking at biology and evolution. This is going to be a great Bible Bite. Don't miss it. All right, I'm going to be reading in Genesis 1 today. We'll read verses 11 and 12, verse 21 and verse 25. So starting with 11 and 12, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And verse 21, so God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And verse 25, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. All right, we saw there this phrase according to their kinds. God made specific kinds. This reminds me of a biological principle that like begets like. There are certain types of creatures and they give birth to others like themselves. There are specific kinds. To better understand this concept of kinds, let's review modern biological classifications. We begin with domain. Below that we have kingdom. Below that we have phylum. Below that we have class. An example of a class would be the mammals. Below that, we have order. An example of an order would be the carnivores. Below that, we have family. An example of a family would be the felidae or cat family. A lion is a good example of this family. But there are many cats in the family. In fact, all the cats are in this family. The big cats, the small cats, the wild cats, the house cats, the hairy cats, the hairless cats, all the cats. Below that, we have genus. An example of a genus would be the lynx genus. It is all the lynx species within the cat family. Below the genus, you'd have the species. An example of a species would be the Felis catus. Felis for its genus and catus, the domesticated cat. Kind of like the house cat you saw in the video we showed you earlier. Within this family, we see adaptation. We see members of the cat family adapting to their specific environments. And it's actually quite the miracle that God created the different kinds with the ability to adapt to their environments. But we have to notice as well that they don't change to other kinds. World-renowned biochemist Dr. Michael Behe in his recent masterpiece, Darwin Devolves, put it this way. He says there are no evolutionary changes at all at the classification of family or above. So we see adaptation or what some have called microevolution, small changes within the family but we don't see macroevolution or what people typically understand as evolution going beyond the family. I don't believe in evolution. Now, let me just be clear. Our faith is grounded on Jesus's life, ministry, death, and resurrection, not on the issue of evolution, whether it's true or not. So regardless of this issue, my faith is in Jesus. But I also believe that we can reject evolution. The transitionary evidence is lacking. The whole ape to human spectrum is either ape or human, and it's like that for all the species. Stephen Jay Gould, world-renowned evolutionist, had the honesty to admit this. He said, all paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups, or families you might say, are characteristically abrupt. He also said that the lack of transitionary evidence was the trade secret of paleontology. It's not much better for the genetic case for common descent, and in fact, the ENCODE project is really doing a lot of damage to the genetic case for common descent. The mechanism of evolution is also lacking. Natural selection working on gradual mutations won't produce evolution, because to do so, you'd have to have 
positive mutations that actually gave new information to a species, and we don't see that happening. Again, Stephen Jay Gould called this effectively dead despite its persistence as textbook orthodoxy. But even if there was a mechanism, the evolutionist would have to explain how life comes from non-life, and we don't see that happening, and it can't. Even if all the organic molecules were there, the odds of them linking up even to form the simplest DNA or RNA for the simplest theoretical organism would be somewhere around 1 in 10 to the 33,113th power. And that wouldn't even be all that is needed to get life started. That would be kind of like winning 4,700 state lotteries in a row, buying only one ticket each. That's what Ralph Muncaster tells us. And that is all I need to know to know that life can't come from non-life. But even if we could get those nucleotide base pairs to line up right, the existence of information and design is naturalistically inexplicable. It'd be like having a flash drive with nothing on it. But even if they had an explanation for information and design, they wouldn't be able to explain the start of the universe. The first law of thermodynamics is clear that you can't create something. You can't get matter and energy from nothing with only nature. It doesn't happen. The fact is, we know that the universe began to exist a finite time ago, and that takes a supernatural cause. I don't say that because I don't understand the science. I say that because I understand the science. Now, let's stop talking about evolution and come back to this original thing that we started with. God made specific kinds with a purpose, and he saw that they were good. And you are part of God's creation. He created you in his image, and he is pleased with the fact that he created you and he loves you. You are not just a face in the crowd. You are loved dearly by God and he sent his son Jesus, God in human flesh, to come and live a perfect life and die for your sins and mine so that by believing in him, everyone could be saved and given eternal life. If you're willing to take that step today, why not just do that with me right now? Say, Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are, that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again. Please be my savior and my Lord. If you took that step today, I encourage you, go to growingwithjesus.com. That's growingwithjesus.com and get some great, great next steps for your walk with God. And if you already know Jesus, I want to encourage you that he also has a purpose for you. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we're told that you are his masterpiece created in him for good works that he planned beforehand that you should walk in them. And here's the reality. We live in some difficult times and people all around us need to know the Savior that you know. So please step out of your comfort zone and share your faith. And if you're worried about getting asked the hard questions, please check out our Best Facts series on apologetics. You won't regret it. It's great. And while we're talking about that series, I want to remind you that the Great Commission Alliance media channel on YouTube has all sorts of great content, videos like this, trainings, and so much more definitely subscribe if you haven't already. Hey, well, I'm really thankful that you watched this short Bible Bite. I hope you were encouraged by it. Definitely stay tuned and keep watching these videos. We'll catch you again next time.